All right. Well, I've got to say, one of the things I love about this fellowship is your willingness to plow through scripture. Uh, it's a little bit of work uh, here at Athey Creek, frankly, because when you go through the Bible, it takes time and work and energy and effort. And um, they're not little miniature sermonettes, I got to tell you. But I've always said sermonettes are for Christianettes. Uh, <laughs> and I've, I'd rather be someone who does the work, uh, you know, plowing through scripture. So uh, we have our work cut out for us uh, today. Are you ready? Good, let's do it. Genesis chapter 24 uh, is what we're going to look at today. And uh, normally I take a small section of scripture on Sundays, but uh, today I want us to see the context because we have before us here in Genesis 24, this beautiful, uh, perfect love story. I can almost hear some of the guys, oh boy, got through Valentine's Day. Uh, Now I got a love story, all this mushy, gushy stuff. Well, here's the great thing about the Bible. The Bible is a book of stories, yes, but uh, they're, they're great stories, um, but they're also, well, the Bible's kind of like an onion, you know, it's got layer after layer, and the more you peel back a layer, you see even rich meaning and bless and blessed types and analogies, and uh, you got to see those, or else the Bible becomes this dry book of ancient stories, but when you see the, the stories for what they are, it just makes the whole Bible come to life. And uh, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the story kind of on three levels. Uh, but first, we've got to look at the story, and it's a long chapter. Uh, and I'd like to, if you'd oblige me, I'd like to read through the chapter, make a few minimal comments as we read through it, and then show you those three levels, and then we'll call it a day. Okay, so here we go. Genesis chapter 24. It starts out there. It says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, he said, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into thy country and to my kindred, Uh, And take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, or what if, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land? Must I needs bring thy son again to the land from whence thou came? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. (laughs) Don't you love King James? I I, I grew up with the King James. That's why I read the King James. It's poetic, and it seems like the Bible to me, just because I grew up with it. But if you have another translation, some of this stuff, uh, it's easier, kind of rolls off the tongue just a little bit better. But a couple things that seem a little odd that you might be thinking. First of all, you got a father who wants to get a bride for his son, and so he gets his servant, his main guy, his right-hand man. We know the name of this dude from uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 2. The name of this guy is Eliezer. And Eliezer is this servant who Abraham says kind of weirdly, okay, Eliezer, put your hand under my thigh. Uh, (laughs) What's up with that, Abe? Uh, A little weird. Well, in Bible times, that was one of the gestures you do if you were striking a deal, making a covenant with a guy. You'd say, hey, man, put your hand under my thigh and let's make sure this is legit. Okay. Aren't you glad we kind of moved more to the handshake? I I, I have to say, I like the handshake. Uh, It's great. Uh, It's a deal. (laughs) Keep your, keep your thigh away from my hand. Uh, don't want any part of that. But in Bible times, it was legit and cool and, and all that. So Abraham's saying, man, here's what I want you to do. And, and, and Eliezer says, but what, what if she won't come back from your land 500 miles across the desert? What if she doesn't come back because she wants to see this guy if she's going to marry him? Uh, should I take Isaac back to that land? And, and Abraham says, uh, oh, whatever you do, don't take Isaac back to Mesopotamia, where he was originally from. Just bring her back. Uh, But what if she won't come? Just don't take Isaac back there. I believe Abraham was wanting Isaac to settle in the land of the Canaanites because that's what God had promised to him. And said, this land will be your possession, your heritage right here. And I don't want Isaac going back to where we're from. want him to stay where he is. So he said, swear. Well, it goes on right here in our text, verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, Abraham says, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which spake to me and that swear unto me saying unto thy seed will I give this land. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that that's the debate of of the day. 
do the Israelis have a right to the land? And the world argues, some people even argue, does they, do the Israelis even have a right to exist? Uh, it's interesting, that's one of the debates. But here in the Bible, God gave to Abraham the father of that uh, inheritance through Isaac, which would become the father of the Jewish people. Here it is, you know, almost 4,000 years ago, the Lord said, that's their land. But that's just something to think through. But he says, man, the Lord gave this to thy seed. Uh, and he, last part of verse seven, <clears throat> shall send his angel before thee and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither or, you know, to the land again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning the matter. Well, the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hands. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia into the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city or outside of the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that the women go out to draw water. Pretty smart, wouldn't you say? Okay, when's the girls gonna, when are the girls here? Uh, and he says, okay, evening time, cool. So he's out there and he says, and we're gonna learn verse 12, he's kind of talking to himself. He says, oh Lord, my God, my uh, master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city will come out to draw water. And it, let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. And let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. So Eliezer goes to the well and he says, okay, here's my plan, Lord. And by the way, first mention principle for you students of the Bible, we've been talking about this. The first mention of things is kind of significant. This is the first time we see a prayer for direction. Uh, a prayer to God from one of his people saying, Lord, here's what I need is, is some direction. And he says, I'm gonna ask the, whatever girl I go to, she's carrying a pitcher, I'm gonna ask her for a drink. If she gives me a drink, check. And then if she offers to water my camels also for free, check. Now some of you think, well, whoopie do. Any girl's gonna maybe do some of that stuff. But think about it, you gotta do the math. Let's do the math. How many camels does uh, Eliezer have with him? 10, they've just traveled 500 miles across the deserts in the Middle East. And when they get back, they're gonna be thirsty camels. Would you agree? And so I did some research. The average camel after a journey about that length will drink 10 gallons of water a piece. Let's see now, 10 camels carry the one. You've got 100 gallons of water. So for this girl to come out and say, oh, would you like to drink water here? Oh, and by the way, I'll fetch 100 gallons of water with my little pitcher here for your uh, stinking camels. I mean, that's not, that's not like a just maybe this will happen, maybe it won't. That's like a big thing. So he says, that'll be the test to see if God is with me, to see if God has really chosen that woman for Isaac. So that's the test. Let's see what happens. It says in verse 15, it came to pass that before he had done speaking, <laughs> that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, and with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. Uh, some of your margins say she was of good countenance. The idea, she was this uh, beautiful woman, but not just beautiful, but she had a countenance that was good. It's, it's like um, there's people that are, have kind of yes faces and people that have no faces. You know what I'm saying? And she's kind of the yes face. Like, that's probably a nice girl, just by her countenance. I think, by the way, Christians, we should have good countenance because we've been saved and we've been forgiven for our sins and we, we have a hope of heaven. We should truly be people that have good countenance, but just something to think about. This damsel, she was very fair to look upon and it says she was a virgin. Neither had any man known her and she went down to the well and filled up her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she hastened and let down her pitcher on her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. Ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. 
Verse 20, and she hastened and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man, Eliezer, took a golden earring, FYI, just freebie for you, nose ring, original Hebrew, (laughs) for you nose ring people, just a little biblical uh, support for you. Uh, It's a nose ring, look it up, check it out yourself. But uh, he gives her this uh, nose ring of a half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of uh, 10 shekels weight of gold. Man, bring it out the bling. Verse 23. And he says, whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which bare unto Nahor. She said, moreover to him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. This is one of the first of many times where Eliezer just goes, oh Lord, praise be your name. He just kind of busts out uh, spontaneous praise. We'll see that again. Verse 27, and he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren and the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. She runs back and says, man, there's this dude out there and he gave me this bling and I fed his camel's water and man, it's like, what's the deal with this? Well, notice there's a phrase here I want you to catch in the story before we go on. Verse 27, he says, Eliezer says, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Real secret. Real secret, I think, to good spiritual walk, spiritual life. A lot of people say, well, I'm open, man. If God wants to use me, we'll see what happens. And we just sit around. But I've noticed that God, oftentimes, it's when you're in the way, on the way, um, then the Lord starts to lead you. Uh, The old thing, you can't steer a parked car. And I think sometimes the Lord wants us to move forward, even though we don't even have a clue what we're doing or where we're going or how we're gonna do it then the Lord kind of shows you the way. Honestly, uh, there's a bazillion things in my life where I didn't have a clue, and I still don't uh, know what I'm doing. People say, Brett, how did you start a church and get all that stuff going? And people, I have no idea. <laughs> I started, we moved up here and just started teaching the Bible, and people started coming, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's just kind of funny how the Lord just sort of puts things together, and it really is cool. Uh, I don't have a clue. Well, Eliezer goes without knowing, and then the Lord starts to lead him. Real secret. I think that's good for all of us to learn from this dude. Well, uh, now we're introduced to a new guy in the story. Verse 29, Rebecca had a brother and his name was Laban and Laban ran out unto the man unto the well. Now, who is this Laban? He's gonna be a Bible character. We're gonna study here in the next several weeks. And Uncle Laban, well, he's the guy in the story. Uh, you gotta kind of picture who he is. He's sort of this kind of goofy, sort of strange, um, a little bit greedy, uh, a bit tricky. In fact, if you could picture in your mind's eyes, anybody seen the Napoleon Dynamite? Remember that movie from a while back? Um, picture Uncle Rico and then you got Uncle Laban. Same, same dude right there, okay? <laughs> Uncle Rico, Uncle Laban, same thing. Uh, so Uncle Laban's this guy who's just kind of slimy and you know, the reason he's running out is because he sees all the gold and silver that, that his sister comes back with. Oh, I gotta go out and meet this guy. There's, there could be some uh, mucho dinero here for this, uh, from this guy. So he runs out to greet and it says in verse 30, it came to pass when he, Laban, Uncle Rico, saw the earring, the nose ring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands. And when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister saying, thus spake the man unto me that he came unto the man and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, come in thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house and he ungirded or unbridled his camels and gave straw and provender to the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat. I don't understand this scripture. Um, This is one I'm still praying about, still trying to figure out what the Lord's trying to tell us. Uh, But I have no idea. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's not until heaven we'll understand these things. So so, uh, before he set the meal out, he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly. He has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. 
And Sarah, my mother's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old unto him that hath given all that he hath. And my master hath made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure, the woman will not follow me. And he said, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then thou shalt be clear from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred, and if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. Now pause for a second. Some of you are saying, Brett, didn't we already kind of read that? Didn't you have to say uh, ditto or just like I said in the earlier part of the chapter, hey, we're about ready to tell the whole story over again. You're like, Brett, that's what the Bible, what's with the Bible, the redundancy? Why does the Bible tell stories and then tell it over again? And we read it multiple times. Couple things, just wanna say, I believe in the Bible when you see stuff that's kind of reiterated or spoken over and over again or seemingly redundant, can I just tell you, uh, there's a reason for it. Uh, I don't always know the reason, but I believe the Lord puts an exclamation point around something that he reiterates and something that's seemingly redundant. And it's worthy of giving it attention. For that reason, I'm gonna continue to read. This is the Bible, this is God's word. He says, oh yeah, you wanna hear it again? Not really, tough. <laughs> Let's read it again. Okay, Brett, here we go. Take a deep breath. Uh, where were we? Verse uh, 40. And he said unto me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then thou shalt be clear from this oath. Uh, when you come to my kindred, and if they give thee not one, thou hast been clear from my oath. Verse 42, and I came this day to the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way, which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water and I say to her, give me, I pray thee a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, both drink thou, and I will also draw water for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said unto her, let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give uh, thy camels drink also. So I came and drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, whose daughter art thou? And she said, the daughter of, of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which hath led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with uh, my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. In other words, uh, we do see something's going on, but we don't have a clue. We don't know what to say. So a couple things here. Uh, we got a guy saying, man, this is what happened. The Lord told me this is what's gonna go on and this is what happened. So this is God's will. But it is interesting, by the way, uh, in this, I've actually seen this in modern times, but sort of in an abusive way. What do you mean? I've seen this uh, over the years with single guys going, uh, hey, God told me to tell you, you're gonna be my wife. <laughs> do you see that here? You, you see this guy, he's like, yeah, this is what happened, I'm just saying. But, but notice, Eliezer says, but what do you guys think about that? He didn't say, God told me to tell you, and so you gotta do it. I think that's weird when church people and Christians start saying, well, God told me to tell you. Eh, we gotta be careful about that. It's okay to say, here's what the Lord has shown me personally, but trust me, guys, the girl's gotta get a, hear a word from God too. Like, uh, and if it's, he's ugly, uh, maybe it wasn't the Lord. Maybe it was the pizza you had the night before or, you know, who knows, but uh, the Lord has to show her too. Uh, just to FYI, it can go the other way as well. I've actually seen girls go, God told me you're gonna be my husband. And the guy's like, uh, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. It depends. Depends. Just don't be abusive. I've seen Christians be abusive. And God told me, no, nah, there's got to be confirmation. By the way, in this story, part of the confirmation is Eliezer saying, man, here's what happened. I told the Lord, 
let this happen and the whole story kind of unfold the way it does. And, and it did perfectly. And so Uncle Laban and Bethuel, they got to say, wow, this is kind of an amazing circumstance. And there's some legitimacy. And so he says, what do you think? And they said, well, we don't really know what to say. But they do say there in uh, verse 51, behold, Rebecca is before thee, take her and go and let, thy, uh, let her be thy master's son's wife as the Lord hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Don't you love that? Eliezer just says, man, the Lord is so good. I haven't even been here 10 minutes. And then look what's happened. The Lord has confirmed and helped me find this perfect girl for Isaac. And he just worships the Lord. He falls down and worships. You know, when was the last time you or I gave glory to God for the great things he's done? You know, just bust out spontaneously. I'm not talking about going to church and singing the songs. I'm talking about like just you and the Lord, just you having a heart filled with praise and giving thanks to the Lord. You know, we've got it so good that sometimes we forget to give glory to God. Um, There's probably the best thing you'll ever do uh, is actually meet people who are not like us, who have not been given everything handed to them and uh, don't have all the stuff and the junk that we have. Um, one of my favorite things, uh, big, big deal for me was, uh, um, you know, we have some people that we, we love to support as a church in different parts of the world. We have missionary stuff going on. And, you know, just one of my favorite places in the world is the poorest place in the world. Least caloric intake of any people in the world is a little country in Africa called Burkina Faso. It used to be called Upper Volta back in the old days. But Burkina Faso, we've got churches and pastors that are the Africans there that we just love them and we help send money and food and stuff to those dudes. They're just great Christian people. Well, we got to bring one of them over here to the States. Pastor Daniel Delma speaks five languages, knows Greek, some Hebrew, translates the Bible into his native tongue. He's just a brilliant guy and good friend. But I took him to Bridgeport. (laughs) And you're saying, Brett, you shop? No, I don't. Uh, I avoid that at all costs. But I was excited to go shopping this day because I was taking him to the Apple store. And uh, the reason this was really fun, Athey Creek, we were, were just, what a blessing to be a church that is able to take a guy like him who, you know, he had this old dusty, uh, last time I was in Africa visiting him, he had this old PC that didn't work, just like your new PC. But, um, <laughs> um, so, sorry. And, and so, man, I thought, I'm going to get him the machine of the century. And uh, this was a few years ago. But I took him in there, and all the Apple guys were like, who's this guy? And I was like, I want to buy this guy the best laptop money can buy. And they're all, you know, looking around. Okay, look, and we, we configured the machine. We got it all together. And we got all the accessories in the bag. And, man, it was just great. And it was just so fun to, you know, to, to buy this computer for this. The whole time Daniel's just watching, and he's just speechless. And he's hearing about the speeds and the, and the you know, the storage, you know, how many gigs and all this. And he, you could just tell he was just quiet and watching. And, and, um, and uh, as we finished up, paid the bill, and as we grabbed the bag, we were back by that counter and we picked up the fancy Apple bag, which he still has over there in Africa because it's the nicest bag that he's got. Um, uh, he brought that with him. And it was so cool because uh, as we were walking out, tears just started flowing from his eyes. And the Apple guys were all watching him and they're going, man, what's going on? And he's just, he just starts tearing up and he's walking out and he's walking methodically like this out the, like it's almost like he didn't want to leave. You know, he's just, he's walking and then he starts singing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Tears flowing. And I was just like, no way. He's busting out a song in the Apple store. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you could see there were, there were Apple employees with tears flowing out their eyes. They knew that this guy had never had an, a computer like that. And uh, it's so cool to be, just be a part of that. You know, and I thought, that's what we need to do. I mean, here's a guy who just doesn't have everything just, you know, uh, that we have. And, man, you could just see the Thanksgiving in his heart. And uh, man, it makes me want to be the kind of guy that busts out into spontaneous worship and praise. That's Eliezer. He does it twice so far in the story. He just starts praising the Lord and uh, they're all watching him. Well, verse 53, so the servant, uh, Eliezer, brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah and gave them also uh, to her brother, Uncle Rico, and to her mother, uh, precious things. Uh, so they're all getting blessed by the servant. And it says, verse 54, as they did eat and drink, he and the men were with them and they tarried all night, rose up in the morning and Eliezer said, send me away unto my master. It's time to go. 
got here yesterday, time to split. Well, and her brother, Laban, says to her, and her mother said, let the damsel, Rebecca, abide with us a few days, at the least 10, and after that she shall go. Now, here's where we start to see uh, Laban doing his trickery. Hey, and this will ring a bell. If you know the story and how it's going to come out in a few chapters from now, you're going to realize Laban likes to mess with time. In fact, here's the interesting thing. Uh, this is probably more than most of you want to know, but did you notice in your Bible there's some differences? In fact, all of your Bibles have some different things on how long he actually wants her to stay. Did you guys notice that? My Bible says, stay a few days, uh, at least 10, but your margin might reign a full year <laughs> or maybe even 10 months. Do you see that there's, there's some lack of clarity of how long Uncle Laban... I was reading some of the best Hebrew scholars and they're saying he might even be meaning 10 years. The point is they're not really sure about how long Uncle Laban wants Rebecca to tarry there or hang out with them. He is basically saying, okay, thanks for all the bling, all the gold and your camels and your whole posse here is really impressive. Uh, why don't you let her stay for 10 more years or 10 more months or a year, whatever he's saying. But you gotta know, Laban is tricky with time. That's something that's coming up in the future. And I suspect it has to do with Laban trying to milk this thing for everything it's worth. Man, here's Eliezer with all his gold and silver and camels. Man, just stick around here, man. Let her stay here for a little while longer. And he's trying to work the deal. That's what's going on. Now, that's key to the story as we get on. Stay here and hang out. Well, Eliezer answers, verse 56. He says to them, hinder me not. Seeing the Lord hath prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will uh, call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Maybe Laban thought, well, Rebecca will want to stay home. So we'll just ask her. And so they do. It says in verse 58, they called Rebecca and said to her, will thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. I think she's like, time enough with Uncle Rico here. Time to leave. Uh, can't get out of here. Don't let the door hit you. Um, verse 59. And so they sent away Rebecca, their sister and her nurse, with Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebekah and said to her, thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. Whew, it's a lot of childbirth. <laughs> and let, them, let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. You know, prosperity, protection. Verse 61, and Rebekah arose and her damsels and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now we got Isaac. Uh, the bridegroom, the guy who's waiting to see this girl that his father's servant went to fetch. Does anybody kind of wish you could go back to the days when parents arranged marriages, the good old days? A lot of you are like, no. <laughs> if you're younger, you're saying, no way. But if you're an older person with kids, you're like, we should go back to that. Uh, it's a funny thing, isn't it? But uh, poor Isaac, poor Rebecca. Rebecca doesn't even know what this dude looks like. He could look like Don Knotts. I mean, this is quite a risky deal. She's getting on a camel riding 500 miles to see a guy she doesn't even know and saying she's gonna marry him. What a risk. Well, she goes and on the way. And so here's Isaac, verse 52. Isaac came from the way of the well. Where was Isaac? He was at a well. Where was Rebecca? At a well, keep that in mind. And he goes from the well of Lahiroi for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening time. And he lifted up his eyes and saw and behold, the camels were coming. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, I wonder if he's just like, oh no, I'm gonna see the girl. I hope she's pretty. Um, now, the word meditate, let me just say, this is a word that sometimes people think of, uh, you know, sitting in your lotus position, uh, contemplating your third eye of understanding. But in the biblical sense, meditate is similar, but it's more of a spiritually inclined toward God kind of meditation. In fact, if you look at the Hebrew word for meditate, it means to uh, pray but also to commune with God, to commune with God, to pray, but also to meditate traditionally, to think on uh, and meditate on godly things. That's what he's doing. So he's meditating on the field. He lifts up his eyes and sees the camels coming. Gulp. Verse 64, and so Rebecca lifted up her eyes and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. First mentioned, by the way here, of smoking in the Bible. <laughs> Sorry. She lighted off the camel. I thought that was funny. Um, and, you know, maybe it's kind of attractive. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there, she gets off the camel, lights up. It's like, um, <laughs> no, I'm just, sorry. Now, not to belabor this point, 
but lighting off the camel, it sounds so poetic, doesn't it? She lighted off the camel. Uh, that's just King's way, uh, King James' way of saying she got off the camel. But I've been in Israel. In fact, I got pictures of some of you in this room lighting off camels. And it's not all romantic and stuff. It's like this. Whoa! Whoa! Because they, they kneel down. You know what I'm talking about? They kneel down. It's like you get thrown overboard if you're not careful. You got to hang on for dear life. And these camels, they drop to their front knees. And then they drop to their back knees, which go backwards, which is really weird. And then they drop down. You're like, Whoa! And then you kind of kind of slide off its big, huge uh, back. And there's nothing romantic or poetic. I'm sorry. It's hard to get off a camel in a r- romantic way. But she does somehow. She lights it off. Sorry, I digress. Verse 65. For she had said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? You almost sense a little bit of like, is this the guy, hopefully? Uh, And the servant said, it is my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. That's kind of cute. She's, oh, that's the guy. (laughs) Now, why did she cover herself? Well, maybe she'd been traveling for 500 miles through the desert. It's got dust on her face. (laughs) Maybe. But also tradition was you, you veil the bride before the wedding. Uh, it's only after the wedding the groom could actually see his girl. Uh, what, a, what a tricky deal in those days, man. Uh, the veils are interesting. You know, I don't see veils as much in weddings. You know, I've done tons of weddings, and I remember they used to do the veil all the time. They're so much fun. I'll tell you what, I've had veils catch on fire in weddings. And um, I remember one wedding I did where this huge carpenter aunt was climbing up a veil. We were doing this beautiful outdoor wedding, and the veil, uh, this aunt was on the inside of her veil, just going up like this. And this girl, she was as tough as nails, man. It didn't even phase her. She just stood there, the aunt going like this, and she's just like, just keep going. So I did, man, the carpenter aunt walking all around in her veil. And... By the way, the girl that had the veil catch on fire, it was okay. It just burned a hole uh, in her veil. So when it came time to kiss the bride, she just kissed her through the hole. <laughs> true, true story. So she veils herself. Verse 66, and the servant told Isaac all things which he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother's tent, Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And... He loved her. You know why I love that? You say, well, yeah, of course. Well, what I, the reason I like that is in Bible times, that wasn't a requirement. It wasn't a requirement. It's just get married and stay together, the end. Tough bananas. <laughs> but here it says, and he really did love her. And I think as you read the story, you're gonna find out Rebecca loved him. And it was this beautiful coming together miraculously, not having met each other. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And great love story. See, that's the first layer that we see, right? Just reading the story, we see this beautiful love story. I think, you know, um, it's so cool. You you read all these stories uh, in history, but the Bible's got some great ones. You say, yeah, Brett, people should make more movies about Bible stories because they're better than a lot of the stories around the world. Here's the problem. People that make movies about the Bible, mess them up. I'm sorry, they just do. Uh, I'm worried about these movies that are coming out, like this Noah movie. I hear all kinds of things that are not even, they're like mixing up parts of the Bible stories and putting people on the ark that shouldn't even be there. And uh, it's just a little bit crazy, frankly. I love, you know how they always say the book's better than the movie? In this case, yeah, way better. This is a great story. Now, it's got that first tier. In in fact, if you're taking notes, number one, it's a perfect love story. That's the first thing. And we've already kind of looked at that. It's a great story of love. Number two tier layer, if you would, of this story. As Bible students, if you were with us in Genesis chapter 22, we realize that the, the New Testament says the Old Testament is a book of stories that are types. Remember we talked about this? Examples, illustrations, uh, you know, uh, allegory, or um, even just compare and contrast. There's all kinds of uh, literary tools the Old Testament uses to teach us of New Testament truths. Now, fancy word, not trying to be weird, but something you should know, expositional constancy. What's that? It's when you see the types in the Bible, you should keep going with those types and not jump track off of other types. The point is, we studied last week, um, I think it was last Sunday, Genesis 22, was that last Sunday? where Isaac was taken up the mountain uh, and they wanted to kill him uh, because, like a sacrifice. Remember that story? We, we showed how it's, the world looks at that. Like, That's a crazy story. But it's actually a beautiful story where a father takes his son up Mount Moriah to see him die as a sacrifice. And we saw that that story was an illustration. It was the same story God sent his son to go up a mountain 
to die for the sins of the world. We saw the compare and contrast. And the, it was amazing, really, when you compare that Isaac was carrying the wood for the sacrifice up the mountain, even as Jesus carried the wood of the cross up Mount Calvary. And it's just an Old Testament foretelling, foreshadowing of the gospel. So in that story, quiz time, in the picture, in the type or in the analogy, who was Abraham? Anybody? God the Father, right? And we know that Isaac then was an illustration of who? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And we even saw other comparisons. Remember the two guys that went up the mountain there with them? Uh, with the, like a type of the two thieves along with the donkey, even as Jesus went into Jerusalem on a donkey. And like the story just goes on and on. It's great. Second layer of that story. Well, if you keep expositional constancy uh, in this story, we still know that Isaac is a type of a picture of who? Jesus, the son, right? Abraham's a type of the father. So what do we have in this story? We have the father seeking out a bride for his son. And if you compare that to the New Testament, that should start to make some things come together. In this story, it's a beautiful analogy. The second layer of this story is simply this. You and I, we are called the bride of Christ. Now, some of you guys are like, well, whoopee. I never really wanted to be a bride. And let me just say, you're not that lovely of a bride. Let me just say that right now. I'll go on record. Um, but that's what you and I are called, the bride of Christ. Now, you ladies that are laughing at us, don't laugh too hard because you're also called the sons of God in the Bible. It all comes out in the wash. Uh, but that's the analogy. In fact, Revelation 21 and 22 speaks of us as the bride of Christ. And we're only the bride until the marriage feast of the Lamb. And uh, that's coming, Revelation chapter 21, 22, not to get too uh, busy today with all this, but it's a great analogy. Um, and, and so you got the picture of the father sending out, looking for a bride for a son. But Eliezer, the servant of the father, goes out and seeks for the bride. Anybody want to take a stab? If you follow the New Testament and compare it to this picture, who would Eliezer be a picture of? Anybody? The Holy Spirit. Because the Bible te tells us, teaches us that the Holy Spirit goes out seeking uh, whom he may save and, and tapping you on the shoulder. In fact, the three relationships we have with the Holy Spirit in the Bible, it's first, the Holy Spirit is with you. What's that? Before you're even saved, before you're a Christian, before you're a believer, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is there in your life, tapping you on the shoulder and nudging you toward the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. So if you're not a Christian here, or if you're online watching or you're here to say, man, I'm not even sure I believe all this stuff. Do you ever get that sense that there's this like stirring in your heart that's not really of you saying, man, this is the truth and you need to follow and believe that. That's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is with you. Now, be careful. If you're an, a person who doesn't believe in Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will not always strive with man. Uh, Genesis uh, chapter six tells us that. And that's something that causes me concern because you say, but that's not very nice. Shouldn't the Holy Spirit always strive? Well, there's a point where the Lord, who's a perfect gentleman, he doesn't force himself upon you, but it's your choice. It's your choosing whether you're gonna accept his son, Jesus, and believe in the work of the cross. It's up to you. But the Lord's not gonna bug you your whole life. That's the idea. The spirit will not always strive. So can I just give you this advice? When you feel this tapping on the shoulder from the Holy Spirit, don't delay, man. Today is the day of salvation. Why not? Why not say I'm gonna believe and accept the work of the cross of Jesus? Um, I like the urgency even of Eliezer saying, today is when Rebecca needs to come with me. Uh, who was it that was trying to slow the process down? Uncle Laban, Uncle Rico. He was the one saying, oh, why, why follow Eliezer today? And, and in this comparison, that's the way the world is. I think Laban is sort of a type of the world saying, why become a Christian today when you can become a Christian tomorrow? Why, why, do, why shouldn't you just delay, you know? And that's what the enemy, I think, wants to do. That's what Uncle Laban's doing. Ah, don't go with them today. Maybe 10 years from now. Maybe 10 months from now. I'll become a Christian when I really understand everything about the Bible. Well, that means you'll never become a Christian because we don't all understand everything about the Bible. But there's that tapping on the shoulder. That's the Holy Spirit who's with you. And there's other relationships. He's also in you. When you become a believer, the Holy Spirit it fills your life, the Bible says, and he gives you wisdom and direction. And, and uh, that's the second relationship. And then in Acts chapter one and two, we read about the third relationship where the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Um, and that's where the Lord moves through you. It's not by your own might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, okay? And that's where we get strength. 
from the Lord to do his will. Uh, those are the three relationships. So in this story, it's that with kind of analogy that the Holy Spirit was with Rebecca saying, you, you need to come with me and I wanna uh, show you the bridegroom. So this is a beautiful, uh, really a picture of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And so you got Eliezer being the Holy Spirit pictured. Uh, Rebecca pictures us, the church. And you got Uncle Laban, who's kind of a picture of the world, and Abraham, who pictures the father who sends his servant to go seek a bride for his son. Are you with me? It's a great analogy, and I would encourage you to read through the story maybe again this week and say, man, let's, let's, because there's so many things here that we could actually talk about. Uh, you know, I mean, there, I, I, I'm not even skimming the surface. Look at verse uh, 53. I'll give you one example. So the servant, Eliezer, who's a type of what? The Holy Spirit brought, once, they, once the bride is, they give her the green light to go, it says, he brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold raiment, and gave them to Rebekah, and he even gave her brother also and her mother precious things. What does the Holy Spirit give to the church when we choose to follow Jesus? Anybody? Gifts. The gifts of the Spirit that we can talk about, but I'm not going to because we don't have time. But uh, when we go through the Bible, you'll see how the gifts of the Spirit are to be coveted and blessed. You could go on and on with the analogy. I'm not going to work it over too hard, but you can if you want. Well, so number two, a picture of the church and Jesus Christ, the bride and the bridegroom. Uh, a perfect love story, number one, a picture of the church, number two. And finally, lastly, we have a paradigm for single people. Paradigm, just a fancy word. Keep my P's going. You got a picture of Christ. You got a perfect love story, but you also have a paradigm for single people. Uh, what's paradigm? It's a model, an example, a, a good uh, you know, way to, to follow, a good analogy for you as a single person. So, For you singles, how many single people do we have in this room? Raise your hand, boldly, happily, yes? Okay, everybody's like, I'm a single person. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, That's that's good, I'm glad you're here. But let me just say a couple things about singleness. I think that today is the hardest time to be a single person in the history of the world. I really believe that. And it's because of the expectations this world we live in puts on single people. And the times have changed, you know, and and I have to ask myself, are things better today than they were, oh, even a century ago? You know, dating is something. Uh, Dating is no good. It's all this pressure and, you know, they're trying to figure out new ways to date because the old way is such a headache and such a well, it's, it's become this twisted thing. In the old days, it used to be courting where, you know, the guy would get all cleaned up, take a shower, brush his tooth, comb his hair, (laughs) tell you what, man, and he'd be all ready to roll. And he'd go in and meet the dad, the mom, the, the girl would be safe, you know, safe distance away. And uh, the mom and dad would grill the poor guy and what are you gonna do for a living? And you know, what's, what's your intentions with my daughter? And all this stuff and they would, it was old school. And if they really liked the guy, they'd actually let the girl come and sit in, in the same room, leaving plenty of room for the Holy Spirit right between them, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and there was no sex. There was no expectation of, of you know, the girl putting out. See, here's what happened. Uh, as, as the whole dating thing happened, it, it moved from the, the guy meeting the parents to, you know, in the 50s, the guy would bring his hot rod that he got, got all fancied up for his girl. He'd honk the horn out in the front yard, and the girl would run out and say, see ya, pops. And she'd get in the car, and the guy would take her out on a nice dinner and pay for the dinner. And because he got the car cleaned and he got the steak paid for, then she, in the 50s, 60s, started to be expected, really, to put out. He did all that. She needs to reward him. And sadly, this is what our culture has done sexually. There's this expectation in the world to say, oh man, look what he did. Now now it's your turn, girl. And and so the whole sex outside of marriage thing, back in the 50s, it wasn't so accepted. But as as our culture warms up, here's the question I just simply ask. Are we better off as couples, as people, as as just as Americans, are we better off with this newer system of dating and living together before we're married and all that stuff, trying each other out to make sure you're compatible sexually. Are we better off with that whole plan? Well, let me just show you a few things. Uh, In fact, uh, in the 1970, if you do kind of a a poll and find out what's going on, they've actually done these studies. In 1970, 36% of Americans were unmarried. Uh, That is 36% unmarried, not having been married, still single. In 1980, that number went up to 39% of Americans were unmarried. 
In 1990, it went to 41%. In 2000, it went up to 44%. In 2012, the most recent study I could find, it went up to 53%. More than half of Americans remain unmarried. Uh, and the idea of marriage is becoming less and less popular. <clears throat> In fact, most people are saying the reason marriage is on the decline, down to 53%, and, and if, you do, if you graph it out, it's, it's ramping up people's dislike for the institution of marriage. It's ramping up ever so steeply. And people are saying, what's the deal? Why doesn't anybody want to be married anymore? What's, what's happened to the institution of marriage? Well, I'll tell you why it's going down, just from what I can tell. People are not getting married because they can, instead, it's totally cool in our culture to just rent someone. You know, you, you live in the house with them until you get sick of each other. In fact, in Europe, did you know you can actually get married, but it's a three-year contract? You get married for three years. There's places in Europe you can get a wedding certificate that, that expires in three years, and then you're free of your commitment. You can move on with life, and it's their way of kind of taking care of the problem of divorce. So you just got to fulfill three years. Hmm. Is that what marriage is? See, uh, that's the big thing. We're trying to redefine what marriage is, but the Bible thousands of years ago, it's so funny to hear people on the news say, well, marriage is not defined by something that was written 3,500 years ago. And I would say, are you kidding? The Bible is where we first read about legitimate marriage, what marriage really is. And even Jesus, if you think Jesus was a good guy, even if you don't believe he's the Messiah, which I do, but even if you don't, there's a lot of people, oh, Jesus was a good teacher. If you believe that, which is kind of funny to me, but if you do, he said that marriage is forever. And what God has put together, let nobody put, pull apart. It's never to be broken. Marriage is a, and, and, and divorce is only because Jesus said of the hardness of men's hearts. That's why divorce happens. So Jesus kind of defines marriage and even says marriage, as Jesus said, I'm not, these aren't my words. Jesus says marriage is, is a, a, between a man and a woman. That's what Jesus defined marriage as. It's kind of interesting in Mark's gospel, he talks all about that. So you say, okay, controversial. But what's sad is our culture is sort of saying marriage is for the birds, man. So let's just live together till we get tired of each other and then we'll blow it off and move on. But are those relationships really great? Are they healthy? Are they good? You know, the sad thing is, uh, even of the people that consider marriage as legitimate, so you've got less than half of the people in America even wanting to be married or getting married now, and half of those are failing. I'm just saying our relationships today are a total train wreck. And, and as, a, as a counselor over the last 20, 30 years of doing this thing, one of the things I've noticed is the marriages are doing worse today by far than they were doing 20 or 30 years ago. It's not just me saying that from, a, you know, talking to people. It's me saying that just on a statistical truth. Could it be that if we rewind and look where we went wrong, could it be the very basics of stuff? I know I'm going to sound like an old fogey and all this stuff, but frankly, the way God designed it, 1 Corinthians 7, it says it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, it doesn't mean touch. It means sensually touch a woman. It's good. And to avoid fornication, which is a fancy word for saying sexual immoral stuff. It says, let every man have his own wife and every wife have her own husband. And, uh, and then it says the man's body is the wife's and the wife's body is the man's. And, and then the book of Hebrews talks about how the marriage bed is undefiled, man. Sex is God's invention. In our culture, sex is just a thing to play around with. Like our culture, it's fun, so do it. And, it and, and you know what's sad? Even locally here in our local junior high schools, this might be a shock for you moms and dads that aren't in the know on this stuff, but there was a, a study done in our local junior high middle schools around this area, and they found that the rise of sexual behavior in junior highers, middle schoolers, is ramping up ever so fast. And the, the big thing in the last 10 years in middle school is buddy sex, just buddy sex. Uh, sex with no strings, you're just friends and you want to play around and have fun. And that's the way our world views sex. It's just entertainment. But here's the thing that's kind of, kind of tricky. The Bible says sex is more than that. And the Bible's not fuddy-duddy or old-fashioned in the sense of saying sex is evil. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says sex is beautiful. God invented it. It was meant to be an awesome thing. But it's more than just entertainment. 
The Bible says it's actually the pouring of your soul into another person for the rest of your life. And it's this, this beautiful union, body, soul, spirit, linking together. And see, the problem is when we treat sex like a plaything that we can just toss around, we don't even realize what we're doing to our own selves. The Bible even says about a man who goes out and commits sexual immorality, it says he destroys his own soul. What, what's that mean? I was talking to a guy about this years ago down in Southern Oregon. I said, man, you know, he was saying, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't have any problem with sleeping with as many girls as I can find. I said, really? You know, the interesting thing is the Bible says every time you do that, you're destroying your own soul. He says, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, the, it's, it's like the Bible treats it as you're pouring part of yourself into another person's life. And he laughed and he said, oh, my soul is all over Southern Oregon. He said that pridefully and thought it was hilarious. I said, you know, here's the thing though. Uh, God wanted it to be this beautiful thing. I remember as a kid, it was shown to me this way, you know, that there was just two glasses of water and the illustration was great. I think it was my dad who did it. Uh, with me and my sisters when we were probably middle age, middle school age. And they had all these glasses of water uh, out on the counter. And my dad, he, he got out the food coloring and he put a few drops in one cup and a few drops in another. And one was beautiful red and one was beautiful blue. And he said, look how nice that looks. He says, now, now marriage, when you get married the right way, he says, when you have sexual intimacy, you, you pour each other into each other. And he kind of poured them back and forth and, and it became this beautiful royal purple color. We we're like, wow, that's cool. And, uh, and he was not teaching us sex is evil. He was saying sex is awesome and beautiful. That's what he was teaching us. But he said, but here's the world. The world says you can have sex with whoever you want. Bible says you're putting part of your soul into other people. So let's try that. Let's try what the world does. And so he, he got out the other glass of the water and put, put green in one and he put yellow in the other. And there's all these colors and they looked nice. But then he took the, the purple and mixed it with the green and the green mixed it with the yellow. And then he just kind of kept mixing and said, see, the more you do this, look what happens. What color is this? And we're like, vomit brown? <laughs> it kind of looks like vomit brown to me. Baby poop orange? <laughs> I mean, we didn't know quite the name for the color but it wasn't pretty like the golden or the, probably the purple that we saw at the beginning. And see, my dad and mom would teach us and say, see, when you pour yourself into more than the person God has for you, man, you end up kind of having your soul just kind of darkened up and it's not so cool. And see, you, you might think, well, but that's very old fashioned of you. But again, I ask you, are we really doing better with our relationships? Are marriages is happier? Are kids growing up with a mom and a dad? Are our, 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 our marriages, do they even have legitimacy? Why are people running? By the way, there's only one group that's really running for marriage. It's the homosexuals. They're like, yay, marriage. Isn't it, isn't it something? The heterosexuals are saying, no, marriage, get it up. But the gay people are like, yeah, we want marriage. And, and, and you kind of wonder what happened. Why is marriage so bad for the heterosexual and yet the homosexual is saying it's what they want to do? I just think it indicates that we may be having the wrong view of what the whole thing's all about, frankly. In this story, you say, Brett, what's the model for single people? You said it's a paradigm for singles. Well, I'm gonna sound really old fashioned, but notice that Isaac wasn't at the rave party in downtown Portland looking for a bride. Where was Isaac? Well, we see him at the well at the beginning, Lahiroi, and then he goes out into the field to meditate upon the Lord. What's Rebecca doing? She's at the well, just being this beautiful virgin, virgin. And she's just serving and she's beautiful. She's sweet. She's kind. And man, she's just doing what she feels called to do. She's not out hunting for her husband. See, and I, I do worry that sometimes people try to make relationships happen. And if you're a single person, can I implore you? Don't manipulate. Don't try to make it all happen. Um, don't cave to the pressure. Wow, you're 21 and you're not married yet. What's wrong with you? Like, that's just so not cool at all. The best thing you can do as a single person is just to wait upon the Lord and let him orchestrate the events to bring the right person into your life in his time. It sounds trite, but it's true. The best, it's, the best thing is not to try to find the right person. The best thing you can do as a single person is to be the right person. Just live your life the way God wants you to live. That's what Isaac was doing. That's what Rebecca was doing. And you know what? In the context of that, they met each other by the Lord, by his Holy Spirit, bringing them together. 
If you believe in God, do you think he's pacing up in heaven? How am I going to get these two people together? Man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess we got to sign up to eat harmony, God says. <laughs> got to make this happen. Now, now, let me say, it's a little tricky because I've seen some good people, good marriages come out of eat harmony. I got to admit, years ago, I used to criticize that and say, come on, that sounds kind of desperate. But I've actually met some really amazing couples who've come out of that kind of thing. But boy, you better make sure that's the Lord. I used to say, man, why go online? It's dangerous. You're going to meet somebody in a coffee shop and you don't even know where they're That could be really dangerous. And then I, I realized it's dangerous no matter where you go if you're single. You can meet somebody here at this church and they might be a serial murderer for all I know. And I'm their pastor. <laughs> I can't promise you that either from here. But I do want to say that uh, the key is to say, I'm not going to try to manipulate the situation. I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. And I'm going to make sure that we're lined up and that this is truly Lord. You know, um, the Bible talks about how you are body, soul, and spirit. You're like, even as God is a holy trinity, we're, we're, we're kind of made up in a three-part being too, body, soul, and spirit. And, and my hope and prayer for you as singles is that you line up on all three. Most couples will settle for two out of three. I met one couple who settled for one out of three. Uh, what do you mean? Well, you know, body, are you physically attracted to each other? Hopefully that's in place. This one couple I did a premarital, that wasn't the case. Like, um, I'm like, what do you guys like about each other? And they went through a few small things. I said, are you attracted to each other? And they're like, no. <laughs> I was like, whoa, Nelly, man. Shouldn't that be kind of a part of merit? I mean, this part, well, that's just so surfacey. Uh, no, it's not. It's legitimate. You should, li- you should like the other way the other person looks. I think that's kind of important. Um, body. Uh, I knew that right out of the gate, by the way, uh, with Debbie, uh, my, my beautiful wife. Th- th- this is how it happened for me. I wasn't out looking for a girl at the rave party. I was at a district track meet in high school, senior year, put in the shot, uh, did my events, and a buddy of mine said, hey, man, let's go get a burger at the Snack Shack. And so it was kind of cool. We, had our, we were at our, um, our rival school, Grants Pass High School. We, we, we were the enemy, enemy territory. But we went to the snack shack and it just so happened that the cheerleaders were in there and this guy says, oh, by the way, I have a friend who's in there. I want to introduce you to her. And he said, I'm not kidding. He said, you're about to meet your future wife. That's what he told me. And I'm like, oh, knock it off. That's so stupid. And we went to the thing and then I saw. (laughs) There she was, a blonde haired, blue eyed girl with a hamburger in her hand. (laughs) Man, I heard angels singing. But I quickly, as a Christian kid, just said, man, I'm just not going to, that's so surfacy. And I went and got the burger. I was like, man, Lord, if I could have a girl that looked like that. But, you know, she's a cheerleader and that's so surfacy. And anyway, I left. Well, uh, a few months later, we had a student council meeting with all the schools in the district meeting at Grants Pass High School. And I was secretively kind of hoping to see that girl again. And uh, we went down the hall and sure enough, there she was. She walked up and said, Hi. And she started talking to me about where she'd been. She went to this retreat where they were doing some Bible study and this guy was teaching the word and she started sharing with me all the stuff that the Lord was showing her personally. And I was like, she's beautiful. She's got a hamburger and she loves the Lord. (laughs) Man, this is good. So then we started, you know, hanging out, went out to coffee. I remember the first, uh, you know, time we hooked up for a dinner. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I planned my uh, wisdom teeth removal, all four of them. Uh, in one day. And then in that afternoon, I was planning on going to uh, dinner with her. <laughs> a little awkward because you don't have to do your wisdom teeth. You're kind of bleeding and drooling and stuff still. And your, your lower lip's like, uh, and it's, uh, that's what I did. Went to the place and uh, had a nice dinner there with my beautiful wife-to-be. But see, the thing that was so cool is we lined up not only uh, just being attracted, body, soul, which is your mind. In fact, the word for soul in the, in the Greek of the New Testament is the word psyche. So that's the same thing as your mind, your emotions, your inner part of you. But the third one that people leave out is spirit. Are you on the same page spiritually? That's why, by the way, Abraham had Eliezer travel so far from the land of Canaan. There were no girls there that were spiritually inclined like Abraham, like Isaac. They were doing their own Canaanite kind of spirituality. Abraham wanted somebody from his neck of the woods that believed in the, in the true and living God. And in the same way, you should make sure as a single person to line up spiritually. Second Corinthians says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
Um, it's not that the Lord says, I hate unbelievers. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you're on different pages. You're not gonna do well. So the guy that wants to be a missionary in Africa and the girl that just wants to shop in the mall at Washington Square, that's kind of a different yoking, wouldn't you say? One guy wants to just live in dirt and bugs and just loves mission work. She just wants to shop. That's not being equally yoked. And the yoking is the idea of two oxen put together with this wooden harness that yokes them. And it equally disperses the burden on the two oxen. And, uh, and so that there's this kind of equal pressure. And, but here's what, what we learn. If there's an unequal yoking, <laughs> then what happens is one of the ox gets crippled and it, 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 because the other one carried too much weight. And that's the thing the Bible says, don't, don't try to unequally yoke yourselves. Make sure your body, soul, spirit lined up. Isaac and Rebecca, as you explore this story, they really were linked, body, soul, spirit, and it was the Lord who put them together. They patiently trusted the Lord through the servant to find the right person. I know it might sound weak, but to go try to find the girl down at the rave party, is she gonna be a great wife? I don't know, but I've told the story before, but I've seen this where the guy's like, oh, she's just so hot. So is hell. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> But, but also, you know, is she going to be a good wife? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing, you know, you come home from work after five years of marriage and you met her at the rave party, but you come home and you open the door, whoo, smells like, well, poopy diapers. You walk in and there's babies with poopy diapers rolling around and there's dishes piled up and, the, and, the, and you're trying to pay the bills and all this. But there she is. She's got the music on in the living room. <laughs> She's busting a move. Uh, it's not so attractive then. It sure was five years earlier, but is she going to be a great mom and wife and companion for the next many, many, many years? That's the question. I'm not just saying that about the girl. Honestly, I could say worse things about the man. But the thing is, you got to make sure the Lord is bringing you together. You see, I see in this story some great things. I see just a great love story, a perfect love story. I also see a picture of the church and Jesus Christ and it's worth meditating on and thinking through. But thirdly and finally, it's a paradigm for singles. Just to wait upon the Lord. What was Isaac doing? Meditating in the field. What was Rebecca doing? Just serving and doing what she knew to do. And then the Lord took care of them. Sounds too good to be true, but it is, it's true. So be careful, single people. Can I say a prayer for you singles? And will you married people join me? Because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, you know that marriage is, is a big deal. And we know that today is tough. So let's pray together and then we'll close up for the day. Lord, we have found that your word is true. And we find that this world, oftentimes we've made things kind of a mess. And the more we try to fix and adjust and tweak, Lord, we realize that sometimes man's notions aren't the best. So I pray that you just cause us to consider and even pray about where we're at. Give us the right mindset, Lord. We do pray blessing on our single people in this church. I thank you for all of them. And I pray that they'd um, be content to be single until you have called them into marriage. Or if you've called them to be single, even Paul said, I would that you all be single like me. Um, Lord, we see that's a perfectly legitimate plan as well to just serve you and be married to you. Lord, I pray that we would all see our role as the bride of your son, Jesus. We thank you for choosing us. Lord, I pray for the people in this room hearing this study who feel condemned or convicted about their own past. Lord, even couples in this room who might feel bad about how they came together and the sin that may have been committed in their lives uh, on so many levels, sexually, emotionally, whatever it is, Lord, I, I'm so thankful for you that you take our sins as your word says and you wash them away that you forgive our sins and that old things are passed away and all things become new. So for those who feel guilty and bummed, Lord, by the mistakes that they've made in their own relationships, Lord, I pray that they would just be quick to come to you and confess their sins and that they would have that burden of sin lifted for that's what we know your word tells us you're quick to do. Forgive us, cleanse us, and give us a new start. But we also know, Lord, that sometimes those things leave marks and wounds that heal, but still leave scars. And so for those of us who've made plenty of mistakes in this life, I pray for those that are young enough to still have those options in front of them. I pray that they would just do well, 
that they would learn from your word and, and hunger and thirst after righteousness. So bless them, we pray. Bless this congregation. As we go our way, may the story just mull around in our minds as we think through your word and may it bring forth good fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's stand together. Well, Wednesday night, we'll take chapter 25 and keep going through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. If you're not a Christian, if you've never accepted Christ, see, uh, it's just real simple. It's to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose up from the grave like he claimed he would. And if you believe that and accept that, the Bible says you will be saved. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you want to do that, uh, man, we're not going to pressure you or make you give money or pledge blood or anything like that. We would uh, love to talk with you and pray with you and send you on your way in a few minutes. And so this is going to be some of the pastors hanging out by the back stairway, all the way in the back. And if you want to just wander back there and say, man, I want to accept Christ. I want to become a Christian. They would love to pray with you. And then they'll send you on your way. Uh, But it's a great thing. Those of us that have accepted Christ, there's no regrets because he's living and powerful and he blesses our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, give someone a big hug before you go and then you can be dismissed.